a palpable list toward the port side began, and the officer called out, all passengers to the starboard side. The port side was where she had listed over, and we went to the starboard side. The vessel had such a huge list that I thought she was going to turn turtle. There was a very palpable list to port, as if the ship was about to topple over. The order was called, I think by the chief officer, everyone on the starboard side, to straighten her up, which I repeated. Everyone on the starboard side, to straighten her up. All passengers to the starboard side, was Lytoller's loud command, heard, by all of us. The captain was there, and he sung out, everyone, over to the starboard side, to keep the ship up as long as possible. The captain was there, and he sung out, everyone, over to the starboard side, to keep the ship up as long as possible. There were hundreds, on the starboard side. We then went up a sheltered stairway onto the starboard side of the boat deck. There were crowds of people up there. They all seemed to keep as far as possible from the ship's rail. She had a pretty heavy list to port. There was a heavy list to port. By that time she was listing very badly to port, and we couldn't get the starboards down. And we couldn't get them down because she had sort of list of port. You can imagine halfway down she would have hit the ship side. She gradually went down by the head and righted herself. Then we were able to get those boats away. She gradually came out of her list to port, and if anything, had a slight list to starboard. I think the ship righted when the order was given to the passengers to go to the starboard side. I am under the impression that a great many went over and the ship got a writing movement and maintained it. And then the passengers came back again in great numbers. And then the passengers came back again in great numbers. The ship began rocking a little bit and we could feel it list and move. We hurried out to the promenade. You mean to say the shifting of the passengers on the deck would affect the list? Yes, my lord. At that height and with that number of passengers, I think it would. She had gone a little more to port. And about being down by the head, could you tell at all? I did not notice anything. I did not notice her being much down by the head. Do you mean that the list to port was more serious than? I thought so. Than being down by the head? I thought so, yes. Did you notice when you rowed away whether the ship had any list? Yes, the ship had a list on her port side. Did you notice whether she was down by the head? No, I did not notice. Did you notice whether she appeared to be going deeper into the water? Forward. Did you notice that? No. Then you rowed away? Yes. Did you see the vessel go down? Yes. Were you facing her when she went down? Yes. It is pretty clear that the Titanic, when she went down, went down very gradually, and that the evidence which has been given about her going down head first and practically perpendicularly is not true. It is pretty clear on the evidence that as the sinking was gradual, there must have been water coming in a good way aft. I could see all the portholes open and water washing in and the decks still lighted. Did you notice anything about the portholes in the side of the ship? Yes, a great many were open. On each deck, are the portholes in practice opened from time to time? Very, very often, we keep them open the whole of the passage. The Titanic kept settling lower and lower. She seemed already to be only half her former height. The ship was settling bodily. The ship was settling down broadside. <laughs> You could see that our stern was uh, getting pretty low in the water. You spoke of a list to port, I think. Yes. At the time that she put the bridge underwater, was the list considerable? Yes. At this time it was almost impossible to walk on the deck without you caught hold of something. Owing to the ship heeling right over, we were trying to fix up a collapsible boat. When she gave the first signs of going under, there seemed to be a tremble run through the whole of the ship. And the next thing we heard were loud reports inside. It appeared to us that when the ship had listed heavily to port, the engines fell out and crashed through the side. Occasionally there had been a muffled thud or deadened explosion within the ship. Now, without warning, she seemed to start forward, moving forward and into the water at an angle of about 15 degrees. This movement, with the water rushing up toward us, was accompanied by a rumbling roar mixed with more muffled explosions. It was like standing under a steel railway bridge while an express train passes overhead mingled with the noise of a pressed steel factory and wholesale breakage of China. The big boat could be plainly seen. She parted in the middle. There was an awful roar, followed by violent explosions. The whole steamer seemed to rock and steady herself for the final plunge.
A violent explosion suddenly shook the entire boat. The ship seemed to be heaving tremendous size as she went down. We watched the Titanic rolling and bobbing like a cork. Finally, Titanic ceased rolling, seemed to hesitate a moment, and plunged her bow. We heard a terrible explosion. And I, as all of you know, the Titanic had four funnels. And when we heard this explosion, the Titanic broke in half. The two forward funnels seemed to lean, and then she seemed to break in half, as if cut with a knife. The ship took a dive, reeling for a moment, then plunging. As the water gained headway along the deck, the crowd gradually moved with it, always pushing toward the floating stern and keeping in from the rail of the ship as far as they could. When the ship gave the first dip, we all went aft. I remember somebody shouted, go gently, as if a sudden shift of weight would have disturbed the ship's position. The bow, which had been pointing downwards, dipped, turned up again, writhed, and sank with the stern, exactly as though one had stepped on a worm. With explosions, the ship seemed to break in two, and the forward end bounded up again. First the middle seemed to go down, lifting bow and stern into the air. With the first report of that explosion, I saw the afterpart of the ship giving a tremble like this, and I thought by the afterpart going up like this and giving a bit of a tremble that the bow had fallen off. I might be wrong. But that was your conclusion from it. Yes. When the afterpart gave this tremble, where were you then? In the water, right before the forward funnel. Did you notice whether the lights of this afterpart were still lighted or not? There were lights burning then. Could you see that? Yes. How far apart in time probably were the two explosions? From 8 to 10 minutes. I should say they would be about 20 minutes between each explosion. From the time I heard the first one until I heard the second one, it would be about 20 minutes, sir. When the ship was sinking, a volume of smoke came up. She broke off at the after funnel, and when she broke off, her stern end came up in the air and came down on a level keel. When the third funnel had nearly disappeared, I heard four explosions, which I took to be the bursting of the boilers. The ship was right up on end then. Suddenly, she broke in two between the third and fourth funnel. The after part of the ship came down on the water in its normal position and seemed as if it was going to remain afloat. Make for the stern, it looks like she will float, Lightoller shouted, but just as he spoke, the stern plunged down.